So I want to begin with the politics of space. And the first centers around this because I realize as I think about what I've been doing that everything I do is inherently political and I'm invested in the politics of space. I don't think anything that I do is somehow not related to the, to, to the political. And as spatial, spatial producers, we have the ability to reorganize and create differently people's everyday environments. Philosopher Elizabeth Gross writes, how do we think architecture differently? How do we think in architecture and of architecture without conforming to the standard assumptions? As she writes, insofar as architecture is seeking not so much innovation, not simply the latest fad, but to produce differently, to engender the new, to risk creating otherwise, how do we keep architecture open to the outside and how do we force it to think? Can architecture become something, many things, other than what it is and how it presently functions? So I'm gonna begin with the first project, which is my own a, a, a solo research endeavor, although I'm gonna be bringing people in with different expertise, that's tentatively titled Birthing Borders and Bodies. And you never know where prompts for ideas come from. And I was sitting in a, my car uh, in 2013 when I heard this ex expose about this um, occurrence that was happening in the wealthy suburbs of LA, where Asian women were coming to this country pregnant to give birth, and they were convalescing in these McMansions that had been retrofitted to house 17 bedrooms and 17 baths. And how it was discovered was because through building code violations. And I would never in my, in my longest memory ever think I'd be interested in building codes as a student. I just thought that's ridiculous. But what I realized because of the work I've been doing with reproductive health care facilities is that building codes are political or it can be politicized. So I have been working with lawyers to help argue in front of the courts why certain changes to building codes in very restrictive states were not creating better life and safety standards, but were actually used to close <coughs> clinics. Um, so we, myself and some research assistants, created very banal, these are very dumb diagrams so that lawyers could bring these in front of the court to talk about what these changes meant. So moving a wall eight inches, creating closets, like these things don't sound very problematic. But if you start to think about cost and the reconfigure, reconfiguration of spaces, it's enormous. So the reason, this is the reason I was interested in the building code um, from the, the, the women in Los Angeles. So also, I've been reading a ton of things around issues of immigration. And last summer, I came across this book by Valerie Lucella, um, Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions. And she's a writer, a poet, and she started to volunteer to do intakes for undocumented <coughs> children coming in. There's a series of 40 questions that the child has to be asked in order to prove um, significant fear. And I want to I wanna read this because I was so, um, it just resonated so much. So she wrote, writes, because being aware of what is happening in our era and choosing to do nothing about it has become unacceptable. Because we cannot allow ourselves to go on normalizing horror and violence. Because we, because, because we can all be held accountable if something happens under our noses and we don't dare even look. And it really, encapsulates what I've been thinking and feeling about this, the potential of doing this project. Um, and as an architect, I can no longer sit there and, and watch these kind of conditions unfold. So this project considers, and it's a, it's a much broader research project, so I'm gonna talk a, a little bit at length about how I'm, what I'm doing. Um, but it's interested in what role space participates in for those seeking to cross nation state borders to primarily enter into the United States, but also to leave. Um, to make their way into Canada. The research examines how space is legally defined and how the needs of those who enter, both legally and illegally, are provided for. The project foregrounds a diversity of subjects, such as migrants and asylum seekers and their personal spatial experiences, ones whose voices are often ignored or overlooked, requiring architecture to gauge in contemporary politicized spatial relationships. More broadly, the project focuses on both birthing spaces and spaces of refuge, how and if these spaces are advertised, citizenship laws and policies used to either allow or obstruct legal rights, the role of borders and identities in nation states as a mechanism to disempower. 
and ways women, parents, and children and unaccompanied minors are using their bodies as a direct means to provide a different future for their children and themselves through transgressing actual space. So section one of our 14th Amendment states that all persons born or naturalized here are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive this person of life um, or of liberty. Therefore, it is legal for foreigners to arrive in our country pregnant and give birth to their child so the child has American citizenship. Commonly referred to as birthright citizenship, this legal right was an important beginning point for this research. Initially, a focus was to examine birthing centers solely dedicated to these women. And the pro project began as one interested in how these women come to the country, the kind of spaces and organizations that are creating these spaces. Um, and it became apparent that women from, wealthy women from Asia, as well as poorer women from Central America, were coming for different but yet related reasons. And these initially drawn to these spaces created to enable women to do this, from these McMansions that I mentioned, embedded within wealthy residential neighborhoods in California, to post-industrial sites right across the US-Mexican border for economically disadvantaged Mexican and Central American women. These underwhelming spaces are often but not always hidden, even camouflaged within their built environments. Early research revealed the intersections between the production of space and reproduction in ways architecture is enabling such practices to occur. However, as the political situation in the United States continues to further destabilize around immigration, with border policies and their respective geographies frequently changing, combined with research trips to the border states of Texas, Arizona, and New York, it became apparent that this original and singular focus on the pregnant woman had to be reconsidered. It has become imperative to expand the focus to include parents and their children and unaccompanied minors who are crossing into as well as out of the United States because to exclude these groups would portray a much narrower <coughs> spatial landscape. And although the public almost exclusively hears about those seeking to enter this country, there are those who are desperate to try and leave offering a counter-narrative to mainstream messaging. I interviewed an organization in Buffalo that these, these people cannot get to Canada fast enough, but because of bureaucracy, it takes them a lot longer. So the project has evolved to engage these complexities and diversities of migration and the spaces being created to support these geopolitical mobilities. The broader scope of the project will focus on themes including privacy and pub publicity, domestic, commercial, shelter and detention spaces, security apparatus, zoning laws, how borders of country and nation state are understood and legally transgressed, the use of citizenship as a motivation for this transgression, and how basic human rights of childbirth and family are represented and manipulated as an act of political will and defiance and counter to the surge of nationalist efforts. However, for this presentation, I'm going to discuss one of the broader theoretical frames that I'm using that's shaping the work, and then a few empirical observations from two sites that I've uh, been working with. So as this research is still fairly in its early stages, the primary focus is revealing the structures and hierarchies of power at work that enable governments, political entities, as well as responses by NGOs and religiously affiliated organizations to construct the narratives the public receives. The role between and among political actors is crucial to understand the larger influences and stakeholders at a variety of scales and enable to imagine potentials of what sorts of changes are possible. <laughs> As we witness how the US government is handling thousands of adults and children who continue to cross into the US, although right now they're being held in Mexico, these actions must be contextualized within globalization, labor, and capitalist accumulation, the postmodern economy, and the neoliberal state. The, those most impoverished are most impacted by what many argue are unlawful policies and human rights abuses. Sylvia Frederici's work on labor, capital accumulation, globalization, and these effects on women, both historically and contemporarily, provides an important lens through which to think about Latin American migrants and those who risk everything to enter into the United States. 
Often, they are quite impoverished or fleeing extreme violence and life-threatening situations. In either case, they bear some of the greatest effects of these economic policies she's talking about. In her seminal book, Caliban and the Witch, The Body and Prim Primitive Accumulation, Frederiki provides an historical analysis of how the changes from feudalism to capitalism disproportionately affected women, citing Marisa de la Costa and Selma Jones' work and where they argue that the exploitation of women has played a central function in the process of capital accumulation, insofar as women have been the producers and reproducers of the most essential capitalist commodity, labor power. Friedrichi traces women's disempowerment that took place as life became ever more commercialized. <laughs> through this process, where labor moved from providing familial subsistence through farming to labor performed for monetary pay, women's access to property and income became severely reduced. Primitive accumulation refers to Marx's idea about the social and economic restructuring in response to the difficulties that the feudal economy was experiencing by the late Middle Ages. Although for Frederiki, primitive accumulation is a constructive model that connects feudalism to capitalism, where she argues that the, the interpretation that Marx made must be reconsidered because he almost solely considered the waged industrial <coughs> proletariat. Frederiki argues that Marx excludes any discussion of the impact capitalism had on the reproduction of labor power and social positions of women. One of her critical points of analysis of primitive accumulation is that it was far more than about exploitable workers and capital. It was also an accumulation of differences and divisions within the working class whereby hierarchies built upon gender, as well as race and age, become constitutive of class rule and the formation of the modern proletariat. The worker was not liberated, but rather, as she writes, capitalism has created more brutal and insidious forms of enslavement, planted deep divisions that serve to intensify and conceal exploitation. This is relevant in regard to the influx of thousands of Central Americans and Mexicans entering into the US because as we know, exploitation continues today in what Frederiki refers to as this new phase of globalization. We see similar powers at work, pauperization, rebellion, and the escalation of crime are structured elements of capitalist accumulation as capitalism must strip workforce from its power, <coughs> from its means of production to impose its own rule. Globalization has produced, according to Frederiki, the feminization of poverty. And through this economic restructuring, women's material conditions have been drastically reduced. This has led to a new colonial order. Women across the world are being integrated into the world economy as producers of workers only for their local economies, not only for their local economies, but also for the industrialized countries as well, in addition to producing cheap commodities for global export. Although women have been integrated into this late phase of capitalism, the extreme and untenable conditions this produces impacts vast regions around the world. So looking through these extreme conditions this produces, in Gore Capitalism, Saya Valencia discusses or develops discourses that nurture a trans-feminism that confirms, confronts and questions our contemporary situation a situation that is invariably circumscribed, circumscribed by the logic of Gore capitalism. Hoping to expand upon the, con the content excuse me, of border possibilities, Valencia joins Judith Butler in arguing that it seems more crucial than ever to disengage feminism from its first world presumption and to use the resources of feminist theory and activism to rethink the meaning of the tie, the bond, the alliance, the relations as they are imagined and lived in the horizon of a counter-imperialist egalitarianism. They propose the term Gore capitalism to the reinterpretation of the hegemonic global economy in geographic border spaces. Taking the term from the film genre, they argue this is the price the third world pays for adhering to the increasingly demanding logic of capitalism. It is because of the structures and processes integral to globalization and neoliberalism that produces more vulnerable bodies that become mutilated and desecrated. Another aspect to these spatial and economic complexities is NAFTA. Created to encourage economic activity um, among the US, Mexico, and Canada, it was signed in, into law in 93, it, began, it went into effect in 94, phasing out tariffs on most trade between the three countries, and now most recently was 
um, renegotiated just uh, in the last several weeks. Um, and NAFTA created the world's largest free trade area. So that, that's like shocking when you think about that, like in the world. Although foreign investment and overall trade significantly increased, it did not create jobs or development and has created large differences in the number of jobs available compared to the number of people seeking work. These imbalances directly contributed to migration problems. Public Citizen cites US Department of Labor data demonstrating that NAFTA produced a negative impact due to increased imports and offshore production. More specifically, the economic policy impacts the, less, the least educated the most, precisely many of those coming from Mexico and Central America. When considered through Frederiki's discussion of primitive accumulation, NAFTA has had negative effects for, on poor people, specifically women and their children. For Mexico, NAFTA had a disastrous effect by creating a situation where millions of peasant farmers found themselves out of work and specifically in the beginning with corn production. They could not compete with the corn production that happens in our country. As anthropologist Jason DeLeon states, NAFTA created a human flood of Mexicans headed north. Within free trade zones, trade agreements like NAFTA allow transnational corporations to be exempt from labor regulations when producing export <coughs> goods, creating a literal spatialized zone where workers' rights are se severely reduced um, in other words, free trade zones, workers earn less and have far less rights. Saskia Sassen argues that these zones essentially create springboards for migration. In her research, she has found that those countries who receive the greatest amount of foreign investment for export-based production typically send the largest numbers of migrants abroad. With the flaming of xenophobia by this current administration, fears within certain demographics of white Americans have escalated creating negative perceptions of the border and those trying to cross from the south. The border has become ever more militarized by both government and vigilantes. Renowned Chicana feminist Gloria Anzadula writes about the historical border relations between Mexico and the United States. There's been a very long relationship between the two countries that moves between peaceful and productive intersections to ones of war and pillage. More recently, over the past several decades, this has turned more antagonistic. As Enzadula writes, hunters in army green uniforms stalk and track these economic refugees by the powerful night vision of electronic sensing devices planted in the ground or mounted on border patrol vans. Anthropologist Jason De Leon argues that this, these terrible conditions faced by those trying to enter the US are not arbitrary at all, but rather a federal plan called prevention through deterrence that seeks to kill by forcing migrants to trek through the Sonoran Desert. The goal is to render invisible the innumerable consequences this socio-political phenomenon has for the lives and bodies of undocumented people. Although the current government spreads fear about our open borders, several theorists argue otherwise. The border region or space of the margins are critical locations that hold potent potential. Bell Hooks' writing provides important ways to think about the border, migration, and space as a possibility. In her book, she discusses black Americans' experiences where many blacks occupy the margins rather than the center due to structural inequalities. She provides insights into the ways to think about the positionality of migrants and their occupations at the margins, both within and between the US-Mexico border regions. The politics of location, as Hooks discusses, is vital because it includes the experiences of those who are working to counter hegemonic discourses. For her, the act of moving requires one to confront the realities of choice and location. She writes, within complex and ever-shifting realms of power relations, do we position ourselves on the side of colonizing mentality? Or do we continue to stand in political resistance with the oppressed, ready to offer our ways of seeing and theorizing, of making culture, towards that revolutionary effort which seeks to create space. Where there is unlimited access to the pleasure and powers of knowing where transformation is possible. This choice is crucial. It shapes and determines our response to existing cultural practices and our capacity to envision new, alternative, oppositional aesthetic acts. It informs the way we speak about these issues, the language we choose. 
Paramount to the project is how the border is not only conceptualized as a legal, political, economic, and cultural entity, but also the lived experiences of those who inhabit this lineal space and their daily experiences. And Zadula wrote extensively on the borderlands as both a cultural critic and a poet. Her work is instrumental in providing frameworks into the complexities and the layered boundaries of these conditions. As Norma E. Cantu and Ida Hurtado write in her introduction to Borderlands La Frontiera, Anzadula developed borderland theories based on the Chicana experience of those who grew up in South Texas, as she herself did. One living in this region occupies cultural and social spaces of the in-between. So part of this research wants to understand what does a border mean. And when I first started, I thought Mexico and Canada are our border regions. But this map that was created by the ACLU, actually, it's very counter to that. And when you start to think about every edge of our country, they state that 2 thirds of our population live within a border region. And within that border region, 100 miles is actually pretty important. Because historically, in the last, say, 40 plus years, that, 40, that 100 miles is allowed certain um, passes, shall we say, for um, temporal border checks, decreased mobility for the undocumented. So there's a looseness within that 100 mile terrain um, that encompasses two thirds of our population. Another aspect that I've been wrapping my head around is our history of immigration policies. And I'm not gonna go into any of these but just to say, I was, very, I was really unaware of our, of our history of immigration and that our country, to be quite critical, has been pretty much only opportunistic. When we need labor, we'll open our borders. When we don't, we will close them. We, we have created a certain profile of people that we want, and historically, that has been very white. So we don't have a great history around our, our uh, immigration uh, policies. Another aspect that I've been looking at, especially when the crisis, the, the more recent crisis last summer hit with um, the flood of un the undocumented in uh, crossing stations, was looking at building uh, zoning and building codes for these different border areas and how shelters were supposed to be created. So for example, in New Mexico, looking at what the requirements of those shelters are, and then as a diagram, thinking, wanting to understand what kinds of spaces and their approximate kinds of locations as defined by, by the building codes stipulate. And then also doing a series of, of diagrams of the, of the overcrowded conditions of some of these processing centers. Um, I know probably you saw images of them, but when you start to understand the number of bodies in these very tight spaces, it, it really starts to change um, your perception of, of, of how people are experiencing this process of trying to enter into our country. So this policy, this US policy has become even more draconian in 2018 when um, the zero tolerance dis, uh, decision came down, separating children from their parents at the border once they were apprehended. Soon afterward, in April 2018, the announcement um, news outlets reported that unauthorized migrant parents traveling with their children were being criminally prosecuted and separated from their children. Altogether, nearly 3,000 children were separated. And then uh, once that became known, uh, President Trump signed an executive order halting the family separation, but yet within that, that order, there was a caveat that this, this policy could continue. And it exemplifies the impacts when society considers some not equal to others. As Judith Butler asked in Precarious Life, who counts as human? Whose lives count as lives? What makes for a grievable life? Individuals, NGOs, religious organizations, and others have galvanized to directly step in and respond to these human rights abuses, providing care and shelter when the government has not. So in June 2018, in the process of, of when this was happening, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights was quoted saying, the thought that any state would seek to deter parents by inflicting such abuse on children is unconscionable. He said calling on the United States to immediately put a stop in the policy and ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was a UN convention put into force in 1990, and our country has still not ratified it. Currently, the most important and hopeful, powerful impact will be how the public continues to respond. And I think, if anything, it's 
really galvanized me to be far more pro proactive and to, to take on this project in a much more serious vein. Um, so I think in some ways there are you know, some motivations that have happened um, which, are, which are positive. Um, so I'm also doing some mapping, looking at where, uh, where detention facilities are located. I'm also interested in looking at the kinds of technologies that are being employed. So um, I'm sure you've seen images of ankle monitoring bracelets. There are also uh, surveillance towers. There's been digital, there's been, um, ICE has been using facial recognition software to mine data. There's been biometric, uh, use of apps with border patrol agents when they, when they accost someone and to do an iris scan at the time of, of the, uh, once they're uh, t taken. Um, and then more recently, the US government has been talking about trying to collect DNA um, at, for, for these migrants. And I just want to quote um, that the Supreme Court has found that the constitutional right to privacy applies to everyone within the, our country, regardless of your immigration status. And a more restrictive interpretation of the Fourth Amendment has been applied within this 100-mile zone that I referred to, where suspicionless searches are, are allowed, even of American citizens. So part of this research is on-the-ground interviews. So initially, when I started out, I was first looking at uh, birthing centers. And I just cold called a lot of them. That, well, not a lot. There aren't a lot, but some. And Holy Family Birth Center, which is right outside McAllen, responded. So I went and met with uh, the director. And, um, and in the end, they needed some architectural services, so I provided some. And, and actually, a lot of this work has led to very small-scale architectural services. That was never the intention, but it's kind of an interesting byproduct um, when they get to know me and then they realize they have some sort of need. Um, so here is where it's located. Um, it was begun by four nuns who were our nurses, were nurses, and they were providing health care to migrant workers. And they realized there was a need to provide care for pregnant women. So they started building this complex one building at a time. And before I show you what it looks like, I want you to know this is really not significant architecture, but there was a lot of thought that went behind it. So it's wood frame construction. It was built with the idea that it was temporary, that they could deconstruct it and move it wherever else they needed. The land was provided by the local diocese, and they said, as long as you are providing this care, you can have this land for free. And that was, in, that was about 40 years ago. So um, what you're looking at here is the educational arm and their medical um, office area. On the right are these birthing rooms uh, that line this really lush uh, courtyard. Um, and then on what you're looking at with the, with the screened-in porch is a dining facility. So they are literally in the middle of nowhere. And so you live on site if you are working there. And so there's a kitchen. Um, there's a dining facility. On the left, there's housing for those who um, are, are, are on their shift. And then they've also built a small chapel. I had the, it happened that I was able to interview the primary nun who began this. She's retired in San Antonio. And it was really interesting to hear how they were thinking about how space really matters and that the kind of quality of the environment that they wanted to cultivate was very much related to the kinds of construction techniques. Um, they had a garden. And so this intersection with space, although they wouldn't call it architecture per se, was inherently architectural. The second one I'd want to highlight is Sacred Heart Catholic Church. Um, it's located in the city of McAllen. It started in the basement of the church in their dining hall. It became an outpost, um, and you'll see Sister Norma in the very back. She's gotten a lot of national attention for her amazing efforts that she's doing. But it became a repository for donations. Um, there was a small medical space that was converted from a closet. There were temporary shelter, uh, showers in the parking lot, as well as kind of UN grade tents for resting and sometimes spending the night because they, they have tickets once they're um, released from detention. But sometimes those tickets aren't for the next day or two days later. So this became a waiting space for them um, before they would then make their way to their host across the country. So the church was very generous for quite a number of years and then finally told Sister Norma that 
They want them out because there were, there were thousands and thousands of migrants that they were providing care for. So they moved to the center of the city of McAllen, and you'll see that turquoisey um, a caddy corner uh, building site. That's the local tr uh, bus station. So uh, Border Patrol will bring all of the uh, people recently d released from detention to the, to the <coughs> bus station. They make their way literally across the street to what is now a respite center. And last summer, um, I, my husband and I were so tired of reading about this that we decided we were just going to see if we could go volunteer. And I sent out some emails, and Sister Norma was the first one who responded. And so we went and volunteered for a week, um, which was a really eye-opening experience. Um, this is located downtown. Um, you'll see that white kind of two-story building. Um, they had the top floor of that for donations. So um, we don't speak Spanish, so we, we help serve meals. But in the end, as architects, we think about space. And it happens that they needed help organizing and making efficient this 8,000 square foot um, unair conditioned metal building where all of the donations were sent. And so we spent a week in this facility trying to help them become more spatially efficient in the way that they're operating. And it, it really made me aware that we all have good intentions, but this prime one click purchase of a wish list has a result on the other side. There are thousands of pairs of diapers that I don't know if they'll ever be used. And I think how we think about resources and how we think about what we can offer is something as architects we need to think more about. And as a society, we need to think more about. But the kind of surplus excess accumulation that was happening here, all for humanitarian needs, created a crisis on the other side because it was completely not managed well. And I was trying to work with them to get donations, to have better shelving. Um, but now, because the border policies have changed, they're rethinking what they're going to be doing there. So that's this project that I'm, um, this will go on for quite a while, because uh, I, I want to write it up and publish it. So the second project I want to highlight, which was mentioned, was the, the traveling exhibition. So we'll go to a much happier, um, more optimistic uh, topic. So this exhibition uh, is an interactive one with an online catalog, and it will have an eventual publication that tells the vibrant and largely unknown history of how our people in our discipline um, work to advance the values of equality and social justice, specifically around the civil rights, feminist, and LGBTQ, LGBTQ movements of the last half century. <laughs> now what opened in Pratt in May uh, 2018, and it's been traveling ever since, and every stop on the exhibition tour will seek to ways to document and display the powerful intersections of national and grassroots efforts of architects and designers to renew architecture as an expression of equality, refusing to separate how we live from where we live. So in order to tell this history, we are drawn on an ever-growing and ever-expanding network of activists, scholars, archivists, professionals, and students who have contributed text, images, and video. This is done with an incredible team, um, both of co-curators, advisors. Um, so this is an enormous undertaking. And as it moves to each location, we ask for new content. So it's always ever expanding. So it's organized as a timeline. We have four broad categories that the content works within. And what we've realized and, and knew is that there are visible gaps in our history. Gaps like, there, like these exist because so much of the history of grassroots activism remains unknown and unwritten. So for example, among the missing in action are black women architects, who, like African American architects in general, have made only the faintest indentation in most history books. Now what conveys a broader picture of the struggle for diversity and, equi and equity in architecture nationwide. So for this reason, now what is designed to not only teach, but we learn as we move from site to site. The timeline is designed in a modular format to allow space for new stories and contributions to be added. So for example, between Los Angeles and San Francisco, we added 50 new panels from content generated locally. So we see this as a really powerful part of how we conceptualized the exhibition. So we have these color-coded tabs. You write information in. You literally pin it into the exhibition. And it stays there while the exhibition is up. 
So this inspiration began because we wanted to somehow pay homage and mark uh, the 40th anniversary of a very important exhibition that happened in Brook at the Brooklyn Museum in 1977, uh, kind of led by Susanna Torre, which was the Women in American Architecture exhibit, a historic and contemporary perspective. And this got a lot of press. It traveled across the country and was really instrumental in raising awareness about women's contributions to the discipline in the late 70s and early 80s. But one of the things, as we started to brainstorm about this um, like four years ago, Black Lives Matter was really active, I mean, as it still is, but it, it was getting a lot of attention. Gay rights was being talked about and gay marriage. And we realized that we wanted to be able to show the, the effects and the, the larger umbrella that feminists theory and impact had had. So we are taking what is referred to as an intersectional framework. And I just want to quote, um, have two quotes to help explain this. So in 1991, American legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw argued that within more mainstream liberal discourse, categories of race, gender, class, and identity are generally understood as vestiges of bias or domination that is intrinsically negative frameworks in which social power works to exclude or marginalize those who are different. The problem with identity politics, she writes, is not that it fails to transcend difference, as Sun critics argue, but rather the opposite, that it frequently conflates or ignores intergroup intra differences. She argues that the failure of feminism to interrogate race means that the resistant strategies of feminism will often replicate and reinforce subordination of people of color. And the failure of anti-racism to interrogate patriarchy means anti-racism will frequently reproduce the subordination of women. So this became our larger theoretical framework that we work through. So I want to provide just a few examples of each category to give you a sense of the scope. So within representation, we're interested in the role public programming plays in presenting formats for critical thought and mobilization. So we begin in 1968. We always try to provide a larger political context, which you see in the bottom in black. And then on the top are the themes that relate to that particular year. And we begin with Whitney Young, who is an American civil rights leader who was invited to speak to the American Institute of Architects National Conference, um, and where he really lambasted the profession for how white it was and how little that they were doing to include and seek out more diverse people to become architects. Um, and then three years later, the National Organization of Minority Architects was founded to do just that, to create uh, a network <coughs> and a stream of people of color to come into the discipline. So we also then on the a more recent side from 2017, we highlight 404, which is a project by Tiffany Brown out of Detroit that strives to grow the number of licensed black architects in the US. It was named for the 400th licensed black female architect. And she's interested in creating the next 400 licensed black female architects, um, which is a really powerful thing to think about. The second category is advocacy. And we are thinking, we're interested in examples of how architects have used and have merged their advocacy with their design work. So I want to highlight uh, in 1968, the architects' resistance organized an architecture and racism protest, accusing Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill of supporting the oppressive apartheid regime in South Africa through the completion of a 51-story tower in Johannesburg. The Organization of Lesbian and Gay Architects organized in 1994 and founded the first Design Pride event. The group also created the first map, which you're looking at here, of LGBTQ spaces in New York, which eventually led to Stone, the Stonewall Inn becoming a historic uh, site. So that's really powerful. And most recently, we highlight QSAP uh, at a Columbia University which is a group of students who explore contemporary queer topics and their relationships to the built environment through theory and practice. Their ex exhibition, Coded Plumbing, was a direct response to the HB2 bathroom bill in North Carolina. Um, and they worked to develop new bathroom design standards uh, through this exhibition. The third category is academy. We're interested in the efforts made for the Architectural Academy to attract students from diverse backgrounds and to expand research and teaching to include histories of underrepresented groups. 
1968 was a year, as you may know, of many student movements and protests around the world. And architecture students were involved at Columbia University's Graduate School of Planning and Preservation. And they, sh and they struck. And one of the outcomes of their protest was a program to welcome minority students and also help support them as students in the school. And we mm -hmm. highlight the book that Sharon Agrada Sutton wrote about her experience as one of those uh, students when RV Towers were black. And the last category is workplace. How organizations have fought against employment and workplace discrimination in expanded definitions of practice. So lo and behold, it's amazing what you find when you start to look backwards. There was a status of women task force in, in the AIA about women in architecture um, back in 1975. So things are not new, history does repeat, and we have to build and move forward. Um, and then in 2013, the architectural lobby was started to address frustrations with the profession of architecture in terms of how hard we work, sometimes for not enough rewards, um, the issues of debt taken on by students in school, um, issues of sexism and, and pay, un, um, pay equity issues. And this is an organization that is continuing to expand across the country. So my third and last category is women in architecture. And I want to end by talking about this, pro this enormous project I'm working on with Karen Burns, the Bloomsbury Global Encyclopedia of Women in Architecture 1960 to 2015. This is a large documentary project which, map, which maps the diversities of women's practice in the built environment of the global north and south during this key time period. Scholars and architects from across the world are collaborating with us on this large scale international survey of the impact of women's ideas, architecture, actions, and activism. We will have over a thousand entries superintended by the two of us as well as we have a board of 13 advisory members and a, a group of 11, now 12, area editors, as well as informal regional reference groups. The encyclopedia challenges chronological histories of women in architecture by presenting a geographically organized approach to a specific historical period. We cover 11 different regions, which you see represented here, and more or less, most of these countries will be in it. And when I presented this in in other international conferences. Um, in the beginning, we had uh, kind of missed a few countries, and it always happens that we are reminded, which is great. Um, so we're hoping this is the most inclusive list um, that we have moving forward. This lens places individual women within intimately local and national frames while uncovering mobilities, migrations, and transnational lives. This geographic focus counters the privileging of the global north in histories of women in architecture and architecture more generally. By presenting intertwined histories of women across the globe, we also reveal the divergences, differences, and contests between women, feminism, and women's rights. Excuse me. It should be noted that not all histories of women in architecture are feminist. Writing feminist history is an activist project that weds aspirations for social transformation to a critique, interrogation of agency and domination. And as a note on nomenclature, as Devaka Jan argues, in order to reclaim political identity, to affirm women's collective will, the word <coughs> women, as distinct from gender, has returned as preferred currency. So the project follows the transnational turn in feminist histories, theories, and activism <coughs> in, outside of architecture. The analytic category of transnationalism emerged in the late 1980s, but the field has flourished since the turn of the 21st century. This field maps histories of international feminist organizing since the mid-19th century. Another strand critically examines the intersection of histories of women's rights with the global and local, with both international and grassroots organizations such as the League of Nations and the United Nations um, various commissions for the status of women, and another strand examines contemporary activism in women's and human rights across the globe within the frame of globalization. And another strand critically reconfigures the knowledge and knowledge practices of feminism. A transnational project can rethink relations of knowledge and power with new chronologies that challenge the narrative of feminism, women's rights struggles as located in the global north. This transnational approach assumes that feminism needs to be understood within a global context, 
both historicized and geopoliticized to take into account feminism's different formations and the interrelationships because theories, agendas, and political practices are built out of a recognition of how different times and places produce different and changing gender systems as these intersect with other different and changing societal stratifications and movements for social justice. The co-location of these liberation movements is made explicit in Andaraka Siddiqui's account of Sri Lankan architect Minette de Silva. Anariti skillfully weaves together a snapshot of, her, snapshot of her life. And I want to just briefly highlight, uh, this is from an earlier uh, version of her, of her entry. But she talks about the Silva that became the first woman from the island of Sri Lanka to practice architecture professionally. And among other things, she credits her mother's involvement in the related arts and crafts movement with her own interest in reviving the arts and crafts and incorporating artisanal elements into modernist buildings later in her career. She, uh, Anu goes on to write that uh, De Silva's uh, education was interrupted by the tumultuous Kit India protest of 1942, and with new regulations allowing Indian students to complete their architectural studies um, within British institutions, she matriculated at the Architectural Association from 1945 to 47. So this microbiography affirms the assertion by historian Kamari Jarwadina, who observes in her study of women's movements in Asia, the movement towards women's emancipation was acted out against a background of national struggles aimed at achieving political independence, asserting a national identity, and modernizing society. This perspective of entwined political struggle is critical to our project's formation of different histories of the trajectories of women's rights beyond the global no North paradigm of first and second wave feminism. The project writes plural histories of women and the role of feminist knowledge and action in architecture. It aims to decenter the narration of histories of women in architecture that has been conveniently told from the vantage point of the US and Western Europe by primarily white women. It offers different foundational narratives and trajectories by, by a much more diverse collection of voices. For example, the biographies and analytic essays of our project provide evidence to counter the so-called decline of feminism as a Western mass movement during the 1980s and 90s with the histories of the growth of women's rights struggles in the global South, Latin and South America, and Africa. One way of telling our history is, is through this activism of architects, such as Anglo-Kenyan architect Diana Lee Smith, who attended the first conference on women in Mexico City in 1975 and attended the first Habitat in Vancouver in 1976. She has been instrumental in attempting to embed a focus on women in the Habitat policy and projects. Her career has straddled the development policies of the UN and grassroots <laughs> organizing, and her own Nairobi-based NGO established with her husband. Um, Diana is forthright about the struggles involved in transforming the UN and maintains a dynamic, critical, and contested relationship with the organization, as many do. Although there are critiques about the effectiveness of the UN, the organization has been important spaces where women's rights advocates and transnational feminist movements have had significant influence on international policy. According to political scientist Kathleen Stott, Gender would be invisible without the rise of the global women's movement and its connection to the United Nations sponsors' conferences. The project writes biographies of a range of women, many of whose contributions do not meet the requirements of a canon organized around exceptional buildings or exceptional practices. Even when women's buildings meet the norms of exceptional building status, the commentaries and histories on their lives, the explanation of their career paths, do not conform to exceptional narratives because the discourse of their achievement is frequently gendered. Think about Zaha Hadid. As Rachel Lee and An Anu Siddiqo have written, women as everyday architects and authors of everyday architecture have produced works that are anonymous or illegible objects within architectural history. Our project foregrounds women who have been previously ignored and expands the definition of architectural practice to include a much broader range of spatial engagement. For example, this will be illustrated through the inclusion of American theorist and educator Phyllis Birkby. She was a feminist gay rights activist who was one of the co-founders of the Women's School of Planning and Architecture, which was a mobile summer school in 1974 to the mid-1980s. 
Biography as a feminist practice allows different and multivalent stories to become visible, allowing new insights and historic histories to emerge, such as the operations of individuals across several social movements. Our project is strategically structured through an agency of collaboration with an advocacy board, advisory board, area editors, and a very large contributor base. Foregrounding a feminist approach, feminist research within this global sphere through collaboration and partnership, redistribution, we redistribute and challenge knowledge power relations, knowledge production, and the idea of the expert within the production and dissemination of research. Therefore, our project, in order to include more voices and histories from all over the globe to be truly transnational, the project requires the seeding of some power and privilege in order to decenter norms governing the production of history. This concern resonates with increasing bodies of work interrogating the geopolitics of knowledge production. This work challenges the dominance of the North in globally circulating feminist thought. In the first instance, this produces knowledge in a crowd pool sort of way as an informal regional reference group and to produce preliminary names for inclusion that are then collated via spreadsheet. So I'll have a few examples. This is um, an early version of the US-Canada spreadsheet one, and one from Malaysia to give you a sense of how, how we were operating. So just briefly, I want to return back to the quote by Gross that I, that I started with about how can architecture become something, many things other than how it is and presently functions. How can the present function, how, how can we think about um, the exploration of this history uh, outside of what we know and how we currently operate. So I want to encourage you to think about how you go out and take action and be a participant in our built environment. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions, questions. comments. Is that Kevin Blair up there? Yeah. I just first want to say thank you for sharing a very valuable perspective. Uh, there was a lot of uh, really interesting material. But when you were talking about the birthing centers, mm -hmm. you said you provided them architectural uh -huh. services. So I was interested in how you can consider what you do as being either inside mm -hmm. or outside of architecture or how that's being defined or delineated. Thank you for the question. I, I, <coughs> I think I operate on the margins, and I will claim the margins as Bell Hooks claims the margins as a space of the most radical potential. And so I'm really invested in how what we do impacts a greater public and to educate the greater public about why space and the design of space matters. So, what it, so in the example, and this has actually happened in all of my research projects now that I think about it, so when I went to interview them, they were renovating these birthing rooms and I developed a, a kind of friendly relationship with the director. And it just so happens they were going to renovate their uh, patient rooms. And so she's like, oh, you know, do you know a local architect? And at first, I really wanted to find a Texas, re a, re a registered architect in South Texas so that it would be the easiest thing for them. And I went through the AIA, I, I asked a call out and no one responded. And this would have been pro bono work. They operate on a very tight budget. And I realized, like, I can't not deliver something. So I and a, and a former thesis student of mine came up with, I mean, it, and it's just like, you know, room layouts and flow and thinking about where records are stored. But it was a way, and so they used that to build out their, their renovation. Um, so I think, you know, I think we always underestimate or we think that what we do has to be capital A architecture and it has to be a big building or, or really expensive. But I frankly am far more interested in how what I can do and provide to those who have very little. So this is one example. The work I'm doing with abortion clinics also came up just because I saw that they needed help with their public space and privacy and security. Um, it wasn't like I was looking to go do work um, for clinics. And then with the, the respite center, um, as we were sitting in this heat for seven days, it's like we started looking at, well, there's so many things we could do as architects to make it better. Like, we need to also get an engineer in here to work, you know, in terms of um, kind of flow, like engineering flow kind of thing. But then 
I just got an email today from the former overseer of that space. He's now at another shelter and he wants some help to, de to design their, their shelter space. So it's, it, it's like one door leads to another and it's not that I'm intentionally seeking out say design work, but through the research it leads to design opportunities, which I think is pretty exciting. And I would never have come across these projects just in my regular life, if that makes sense. So I think you never know where you can be useful. Um, like I volunteered at my local women's shelter. They needed a redesign of their kitchen facilities for their inhabitants. That led to a, an actual constructed project. So I think you have to just be really aware always of how can we serve. Like we are a service and if you want to improve the world, it's right in front of you. Like sometimes it's so easy that we don't even see it. Um, and so I'm very curious as to if any of your research or the definition of feminism looks at how trans women or mm -hmm. um, other genders, uh, people who were raised as women and then transitioned into who they are, um, is reflected into your research. Um, and so if you use building codes or any other facet. It's a great question. So I, similar to QSAP, I actually wrote a piece for um, the Harvard Design Magazine on the bathroom bill, the HB2 talking explicitly about what these building codes were doing um, against the trans population. So whenever I can, I um, am very, I'm, I am very invested in social justice in the, in the broadest way possible. I will say with the organization I co-founded, Architects, that we've gotten a lot of pushback because there's the XX, and actually, I, well, you may have seen it on the Now What poster. Um, and we we are open to all um, gender identify all women all those who identify as women period and so we rewrote our mission statement to become as, as explicitly trans inclusive as we can and we've cha we're changing our identity and we're, we're getting rid of our tagline so we're trying to make um, we're we're wanting to bridge between um, uh, the issues that have inherently been identified as as female um, kind of biological, that it's female uh, gender inclusion. So it's not necessarily, yeah, I'm just, I'm, it's, I always try to engage it where it's appropriate or where it's, where there's possibilities. Hi. Um, Hi. I was, my question is, I think that it's Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm from the South originally, so um, not that that really gives me any caveat. But yeah, when um, I, we our, we had an exhibition and a call for design ideas for the clinic in Jackson, and I got trolled a lot by um, anti-choice people for quite a while. I, I ended up on Brett Bart News, um, their website, which I didn't realize until someone in my university let me know. Um, so yeah, there's definitely pushback, but I think. I mean, I have a privileged position of being in the academy, and that provides me the ability to take risks that, say, those who are in practice may not be able to take. And I want to use that to its utmost possibility. So for example, with the project in Jackson, that's one of the clinics that I'm working with, that, that site was um, surrounded by two architecture offices, literally. And I spoke with both of them, and both of them told me off the record that they support the clinic being open and wanted to stay there, but they would lose their entire practice if they came out publicly and supported that in Mississippi. So everyone's situation is different, and I think I do have a lot of power because I'm not reliant on clients as a source of income. So I always try to be cognizant of that privilege and try to use it to the best that I can. But I think, you know, if you're gonna take on political issues, you are going to get, um, there's, there's repercussions for that. And I'm ready for it. Uh -huh. Hi. Well, first, thank you. I'm oh, thank you. Back. Yeah. Um, thank you for a wonderful lecture. There's a sea of things I'd like to ask about, um, which is one which I feel relevant with 
the last slide, um, taking action. And it seems like a lot of your research um, operates in areas which are kind of um, activist adjacent. Mm -hmm. And maybe you've already touched on it, speaking about your privilege in the academy and some pro bono design work you can do. But what is your kind of ethical framework for the research you do in these activist, activist spaces? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you approach that? Kind of being aware of your privilege and mm -hmm. what you can bring to the table in this community as you're also getting fabulous research and the support of research we kind of made visible out of it. Well, thank you. Um, so I, got, I, I went to architecture school because I really wanted, and this may sound naive, but I'm going to just say it, like I wanted to make the world a better place. Like I honestly, that's why I, I went to school. I had no idea what architecture meant, none. And I got to school and I completely drank the Kool-Aid of the star architects and that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then my mom got sick after grad school and that changed everything. And I realized you have one life. And if you want to make the most of that life, you're going to have to take risks. And so for me, it's really important to stand up for those whose voices, I don't, I don't want to say I'm speaking for them, but I'm trying to speak with them or provide a space for them to speak. And I want our discipline, so I push back on our discipline, to engage with those who don't even know what we do or don't quite understand why we'd be you know, relevant for, what, for the kind of spaces they have. So ethically, I... I see that as really trying to push our discipline to be more responsive to a much broader demographic rather than, and it's nothing wrong going, I did high-end uh, residential and, and commercial when I was in New York. I learned a ton of things, but that just wasn't for me. And that's not to say it's not right for other people. And I'm not trying to, to um, demonize them, but for me, I found that I find passion and power to help those who have less. So ethically, that's what I'm invested in, and that's where I try, that's where I put my energy. So it's also <laughs> wanting our discipline to be more responsive to our world, more broadly speaking. More I mean, uh, oh, thank you for the question. I think, so it, you know, I don't live in these places that I'm going to, so I'm definitely an outsider, which is also can be and should be critiqued, like outsider tries to come in and save, and that's not what I want to do. I want to try and work with. And I will say, um, less so with the reproductive health care work, but when working with the border project, it was exactly as you described, um, exhausting, overwhelming, um, enraging. Uh, there were all these things. And I'm still honestly trying to process it all. And I think trying to use my work as a vehicle to raise awareness and to, <coughs> to think about the spaces of containment. And people design these spaces. They don't just appear out of nowhere. And the role that we, as a discipline, contribute to that and can, like I'm, I've taught a seminar on that project and I start the first day with um, a debate. Those who would be uh, in support of designing detention facilities and those who would not be. And I divide, I literally divide the room up and they have a few minutes and then we have to come back and talk about it. And it's not cut or dry, it's not black and white. It's like you can't say no, but you, may, you can't say yes, but then how do we how do we negotiate that very complex political space so that things improve? 
Um, I don't have answers, but I think it's important to have conversations. And through conversations, awareness happens and change can happen. So it's exhausting. Yes. 